Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, we're continuing on with Ian Juby's presentation, in which he said he had physical evidence against evolution, and then followed that up with an attack on Darwin's credentials and status as the discoverer of evolution, rather than, you know, the physical evidence. Hopefully today, we'll actually discuss some science instead of me just having to explain why it doesn't matter who first thought of evolution or what their qualifications were. So let's go! His name was Sir Charles Lyell, and he became known not as a great lawyer, but as one of the founding fathers of the modern science of geology. Okay, so I just realized that with all the stuff I skipped, that statement will come across a little bit weird. He has just finished pointing out that Martin Luther, Charles Finney, and John Calvin, some very prominent figures in church history, didn't have any theological qualifications, but were instead trained as lawyers. A fact that weakens his attack on other people's qualifications, as it just essentially serves to show that the educational system was very different in the 19th century and before than it is today. Either that, or it shows that being able to argue for a position that you do not personally adhere to is a valuable quality to have if you want to make it big in Christianity. Which, again, doesn't really look good for his position. Anyway, his point here is that Lyle didn't go to school for geology, which is not quite true. His degrees were a BA and an MA in classics, whatever that means, I'm not really looking into it right now, but it included at least a few lecture courses on geology from William Buckland, the man who wrote the first full accounts of a fossil dinosaur. Now, Lyle certainly did start his career off as a lawyer, but he definitely had some geologic training. Uh, he popularized the concept of uniformitarianism uh, proposed by James Hutton. Now, don't let the big word scare you. Just look at the root word, uniform. It was the idea that all geological processes were uniform, gradual and slow, with no catastrophes. That is a misleading statement, to say the least. Originally, uniformitarianism was the idea that the processes that are responsible for the major features of the Earth's surface were slow and gradual. The way you phrased it makes it sound like they denied that catastrophes even happen, which is just flat out not true. They just didn't believe that catastrophes played a part in geology. For a while, uniformitarianism won, but in the 20th century it started to become apparent that catastrophes that may be infrequent in terms of human lifespans are relatively common when looked at over long periods of time, so we begin to recognize the impact that catastrophes could have on the geologic record. So now we use what some have dubbed catastrophic uniformitarianism as a combination of the two models. It is important to realize, though, that even in a model with the word catastrophic in the title, there's still no room for a global flood. Recognition that catastrophes happen is not the same as recognizing that one specific physically impossible catastrophe happened. In my opinion, this uniformitarian geology, though scientifically bankrupt, has been the single most effective weapon ever produced against the Bible. I hate to break it to you, but if that's true, then the Bible is wrong. Most of what we know about geology has its basis in uniformitarianism, even when the catastrophes are taken into account. So rather than making the entire field of science known as geology something that will break your faith, maybe find a way to work it into the Bible. Like, really, all the information that we've discussed on geology so far can be found within the first 35 pages of a basic textbook on stratigraphy. If you can't read less than two chapters into a fairly basic textbook on geology without it completely contradicting your religion, then how could you possibly claim that science is on your side? Think about it. Did banning the Bible get rid of it? Who banned the Bible now? No, in fact, it only caused more demand for the book. Did burning the Bible get rid of it? Nope. Only made people want it all the more. Okay, sure, that's like the old-timey version of the Streisand effect, where an attempt to suppress knowledge about something has the opposite effect and brings that thing to more people's attention. But what Bible bannings and burnings are you even referring to? Because, interesting thing is, when I looked up Bible burnings on Wikipedia's list of book-burning incidents, there are only five incidents of Bible burnings listed, four of which were carried out by Christian groups trying to suppress the wrong versions of the Bible. Amusingly, one of those four was the Amazing Grace Baptist Church of Canton, North Carolina, which intended to burn a bunch of non-King James Bibles, but 
they got rained out. So I guess if God's watching, he didn't approve of that particular activity. I was actually surprised to learn that the fifth event was carried out by the U.S. military. Apparently, a Christian group had translated a bunch of Bibles into a couple local Afghani languages and was trying to get American soldiers to hand them out and proselytize to the local populations. And when a chaplain found out about it, the Bibles were confiscated and eventually burned. Though, I feel like that burning was more just a method of disposal rather than a direct attempt at disrespect and censorship. But even then... The vast majority of American military chaplains are Christian, so odds are that was carried out by Christians as well, though certainly the military is not supposed to be a Christian organization. It was Lyell who coined the phrase, the present is the key to the past. Yeah, the processes that we see acting on the earth today are largely the same as the ones that would have been operating in the past. Just look at depositional environments. Let's take a river delta, for instance. We see today that when a river empties into a sea or ocean in an area where that sea or ocean is relatively calm, the deposition brought by the river will build up and form a delta. We have no reason to think that this would have been any different in the past. Now, when we look through the geologic strata, we can find rocks that appear to be the result of deposition that makes sense in light of how river deltas deposit sediments. So, given how we know how river deltas deposit sediment, and given that we see sedimentary deposits that look very much like they were deposited in such a manner, does it not follow that we should look at how sediment is being deposited now to help us understand how the sediment in a similar situation in the past would have been deposited? And this is just one example of many, many depositional environments that we find in both the geologic record and in real time today. How many of you have heard that phrase in your education? That phrase is loaded. That phrase is an oversimplified explanation of a general principle that explains how we figure out what happens in the past. You want to talk about Loaded, you spent the first half of your video baselessly attacking Darwin's education as if that had any relevance to the theory of evolution as we understand it today. That's Loaded. How many of you have seen a global flood recently? No one. And I know where you're going. The global flood was a one-time thing, so how can we possibly use the present as a way of understanding how the flood would have worked? The answer is because we do know how floods behave because we do see floods in the present. It's mostly a matter of scaling it up. And we know how sediment behaves in a flood. In fact, most creationist geologists even acknowledge the different depositional environments that we find. They just try to make excuses as to how they all could have formed during a flood. And then they try to present the dry depositional environments as if they were actually underwater somehow, even when there's no actual evidence for such claims. My point is, creationists use the same principle when it suits them, only attacking it when it doesn't give them the results that they like. Notice that with that one simple, easy to remember phrase, he just disqualified a global flood from history because he argues that only present day processes are allowed to interpret the past. Well, thing is, it wasn't just that one simple phrase. There was also three to four volumes of Principles of Geology, depending on which edition you have, and one to two volumes of Elements of Geology, again depending on the edition, where he went into at least a little bit more detail than that one phrase as to why that position is tenable. Not to mention all of Hutton's work that led him to that conclusion in the first place. You see, one tactic that lawyers use is to not attack their opponent's case head on says the guy 45 minutes into a series on why evolution is wrong, who still hasn't actually provided any reason to believe that evolution is wrong, instead choosing to level personal attacks against a few prominent people who accept evolution. But rather to provide a believable alternate explanation for the facts. If you have a murder case with all kinds of evidence pointing to your client as the murderer, you would try to come up with a different story of the events which explains all the facts, which does not even involve your client. Okay, are you suggesting that evolution was invented by a geologist lawyer specifically to undermine young earth creationism, even though he knew it wasn't correct, and that the scientific community has been on board with this plan ever since? You said you had physical evidence. We're more than halfway through your video. Present some of that instead of attacking credentials or methods of long dead scientists. A powerful psychological part of that tactic is to never mention your opponent's arguments or case.
because you are trying to distract the jury from your opponent's case. Well, then I guess my channel, which directly tackles creationist claims and takes creationism head on while being completely honest about this fact, must not be doing a very good job. Now, this is an excellent legal tactic, but is it scientific? <laughs> Hardly. Again, says the guy who has spent this entire video, and most of the last one, doing nothing but personally attacking prominent people who accept evolution, rather than actually providing evidence for creation or against evolution. Like, we haven't even gotten to cherry-picking and quote-mining yet. You have not said a single substantive sentence in this series yet. Notice, he ruled out possible scientific conclusions from consideration, and ruled out huge amounts of scientific evidence from the research and modeling before the scientific hypothesis was even formulated. So you claim... I know it's unthinkable to creationists, but I'm pretty sure that he didn't start his career in geology off with the statement that the present is the key to the past. That was his conclusion after examining the evidence. But that's not how creationists do things, so they have a hard time imagining anyone else working in that way when they themselves can't. The present cannot be the key to the past because present-day processes cannot explain what we find in the geological record. You have got to be kidding me. Like, if you're going to admit that looking at the geologic record is how we would determine whether or not the processes that we see happening today could be responsible for what we find there, how can you possibly assert that Lyle started off with the assumption that the present was the key to the past instead of coming to that as a conclusion? Maybe, just maybe, he looked at the geologic record and realized that what we see happening today could be responsible for what he found there, and so he concluded as the result of his observations that the present is the key to the past. I would instead contend the Bible is the key to the past. A book that is demonstrably wrong when it comes to science on a number of occasions, and history for that matter. Tell me, when in Roman history did any emperor conduct an empire-wide census that would have had people traveling to the birthplace of their ancient ancestors? Oh, that was never done because it would be functionally, physically, and logistically impossible? Well, the Bible says it happened, so it must have happened. Now, including it as the frontispiece of every edition of his book, he obviously considered this site significant to his new history. Yes, the reason he included that picture in his book was because it is an excellent demonstration of one of the ideas his book was presenting. At the time, most geologists just accepted that the Earth was largely fixed. Nobody thought about the idea that mountains could grow. They were just there. That site shows evidence of having sunken and then having been uplifted. Notably, the markings that clams made on the columns, which stopped abruptly near the bottoms of the pillars. This is because sediment from the ground washed up against the pillars in a way that indicated that it was not brought in by flooding, but by a depression of the land that the pillars are on, with the observation that this area of land could sink into the water and then rise out of the water again, it now becomes possible to conceptualize the idea of mountains forming if the processes that cause such elevation could continue for long periods of time. So when Lyell saw this, he was understandably thrilled. Here he was able to point to a series of historic events with profound significance. You see, in his day, everyone knew that the layers of rock we find all over the world were all the result of the great flood of Noah. I don't actually know if they had begun to use Noah's flood to explain the sedimentary layers yet. It's possible. After all, I know that creationists have been using the flood to explain fossilized sea creatures on the mountaintop since at least da Vinci's time, so maybe they were. But it doesn't matter. Lyle was working in the infancy of the geologic sciences. There were many different camps that believed many different things. Any of them could have come out on top had they ended up being true. But Lyle's explanations withstood the test of time, while others did not. I wonder why creationists don't champion William Buckland's geologic ideas. They included a Noachian flood. He even published a best-selling book explaining his views of geology in light of the biblical accounts. Could it be that he, 20 years later, admitted that there was no geologic evidence for Noah's flood? But that story looks almost like someone who started out agreeing with the creationists that there was a flood, but then changed their mind when presented with the appropriate evidence. Not a good look for creationists, but it does raise the question, why do the creationist geologists like Snelling, Baumgartner, and Austin 
all make use of uniformitarianism when doing their work for creationist organizations. If all of uniformitarianism is wrong, and the guy who came up with it just made it up in order to have something else to replace the true catastrophic explanation with, then why do even creationists use uniformitarianism when working, instead of one of the catastrophic models that competed with uniformitarianism back when Lyell was still around? Lyell sought to replace this thinking with his new history of deep time. Did he? Let's see how Richard Forty explains the transition from a young earth to deep time. Lyle saw sedimentary processes now, and he saw how much sediment accumulated in a given time, and he realized just how much sediment there was if you piled all the geological successions that were known, one on top of another, and you could do a crude estimate of how old the world was, and you would immediately go into millions. Hmm, that sounded more like an examination of the evidence followed by the conclusion, rather than the conclusion driving the way in which you present the evidence, which seems to be what you are suggesting that he did. So here he had this historic structure which, due to local subsurface volcanic activity, had dramatically sunk below sea level. Sediments had washed in, forming layers of sediments, just like we see all over the world. Then, just as dramatically, the land rose again above sea level. So we didn't need a whole worldwide flood to produce these sedimentary layers we see all over the world. You completely missed the point of using that area as an example. It wasn't that floods can produce sediments. In fact, we know that they can and do. Specifically for that picture, it was the idea that the very land itself could sink and then rise again. That was a revolutionary idea that completely changed how geologists looked at the world, and that location is an exemplification of that idea. It could be done with subsidence. He argued that contrary to what the Bible says, the seas didn't rise, the land sunk. No, 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 no. You're making it sound like Lyle's idea was that all sediment was formed by land sinking underwater. That is completely and utterly false. He did not use a picture in the front of his book to demonstrate that everything he was going to describe in the book would be an identical situation to the location that that picture was from. It was just an illustration of his main point, namely that the earth changes over time and is not static. I know you're looking at his book as his desperate attempt to prove creationism wrong, but he was actually just trying to understand how geology works. He wasn't concerned with creationism, just evidence. Speaking of evidence, you've got less than four minutes left in your video in which you claimed to have physical evidence. Are you actually going to bring some of that up? Or is this it? Because you're still attacking Lyle here rather than anything to do with modern geology. Because at the end of the day, even if your gross, negligent mischaracterization of Lyle's groundbreaking, pun intended, work were correct, all that would mean is that another 19th century geologist was wrong about geology. How does that do anything to disprove or discredit anything about modern geology? Now, there was, you know, several problems with Lyell's proposition. Number one, if you sink the land below sea level, what do you get? A flood. No, it's not actually physically possible to sink all the land on the planet underneath sea level at any one time, because there isn't enough water for that to happen. Secondly, this dramatic subsidence of the land was catastrophic in nature, in complete contradiction to the deep time Lyell was trying to claim, and a perfect example of historic catastrophe. Wow. Just wow. You know, I haven't read Lyell's Principles, so I'm not going to fault you for not having read it either, but you don't even seem to have read just a basic summary of it. Like, Lyell didn't propose anything like that anywhere in it. So, yeah, good job knocking down that straw man, I guess. 
Now, go do some homework and come back and address some of the things that geologists actually believe happened, like the layers of sediment all through the Grand Canyon that show evidence of multiple inland seas having covered the area and then receded, the semi-arid environments found in the top layers, the evidence of organisms having gone about their normal lives, building burrows and such, right in the middle of the record that you claim was created in a massive catastrophe that wouldn't have allowed them to build burrows and whatnot. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Foppish Dilettante, who says, My toaster failed to stop toasting my toaster pastry, and it suffered apoptosis. I have nothing to add to that. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Jerry the Berry, David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the ancient Greek nutjobs who laid the groundwork for the modern science that is my channel. If you'd like to prove evolution wrong for having come up with it before it was cool, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wish list, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time.